Good evening. It's uh, wonderful to be here with all of you. This is my first time in the Faroe Islands. I arrived a little over 24 hours ago, and just driving around here, it's a stunning, beautiful, a very unique place. So thank you for having me. I apologize that I don't speak Faroese, but probably most of the world does not speak Faroese, so I don't feel too bad. But hopefully you'll be able to follow my English well, and we have slides uh, that we'll be using uh, during, the, uh, during the presentation. And there we go. Hopefully, uh, between my speaking and the slides here, you'll be able to follow along well. And I, I really welcome your questions, whether you agree with me or disagree. I'm so glad that you're here. And uh, you're not going to hear anything ugly or hateful tonight. There's no hatred on my lips because there's no hatred in my heart. We just want to ask the question in terms of what's best for marriage and what's best for society. Uh, I'm disappointed that there's no one to debate. I, I love when people can put both sides of the issues out. And we've done debates at some of the leading universities in America and other parts of the world. Uh, in fact, we were told that a, a couple of people were willing to debate me from parliament. And I said, we can have a panel, three or four, on one side against me. That's fine, as long as we can put the issues out. I was disappointed that no one was willing to, ultimately, because when you have the truth, you always bring it out for everyone to see. So we have nothing to hide. We have nothing to be ashamed of as we discuss these issues. But I want to make something very clear. Uh, it would be completely arrogant for me to come here as an American and tell you what's best for Faroe Islands. I don't know your life, I don't know your culture, but I can tell you what's happened in America. I can tell you what we have already experienced. I can tell you some of the terrible mistakes we have already made, with the hope being that you can learn from our mistakes and do the right thing. So the question, same-sex marriage, is it a step in the right direction? Is it progress? Or is it regress? Whether you're talking about civil unions or marriage, the discussion is the same. So let me tell you what we've learned from America. One of the important words of wisdom from G.K. Chesterton is this. Don't ever take a fence down until you know the reason it was put up. Why do we have certain standards in life and society? Why do we live the way we do? Don't change it and play with it until you understand why things are in place. Well, one of the arguments that we hear all the time is that we should have marriage equality for all. Marriage equality for all. You've probably heard that saying here. We use it all the time in America. But do you know what that actually means? Marriage equality for all, where does that lead? There's a website called the Marriage Equality Blogspot, and it says we believe in marriage equality for all. What does that mean? The right of consenting adults to share and enjoy love, sex, residence, and marriage without limits on the number, or gender, number, or relation of participants Full marriage equality is a basic human right. In other words, if you want to advocate for, quote, marriage equality for all, how far does that go? This website says any number of people, any relation, brother, sister, doesn't matter. If it's for everyone, it's for everyone. And if you disagree with that, then you must be closed-minded, bigoted, and intolerant. The question is, why not? If love is love and love wins, and you have the right to marry the one you love, how can you just limit it, if not to man and woman, just to two men or two women or any combination? How can you argue against any kind of relationship? And if you are using any of these sayings, love is love, love wins, you have the right to marry the one you love, you've already taken on our American slogans. These are the slogans of our American activists that they spread around the world. Here's a lesson from Ireland. As reported in the Irish Times, independent Senator David Norris, himself gay, has said that gay cousins should be allowed to marry each other following the same-sex marriage referendum. 
Once Ireland redefined marriage, this gay senator said, well, how about gay cousins? Because they can't have an issue. Two gay men or two gay women, they can't have an issue with having children with genetic problems. So why not gay cousins marry? For him, it's the next logical step. And he's a senator in Ireland. After all, since gays can't procreate, there's no danger in having children with genetic defects, so why can't gay cousins marry, or for that matter, gay brothers or gay sisters? Why not? After all, love is love. Do you know this is a discussion that's taking place in America today? Incest, why not two gay brothers or two gay sisters? Why is it wrong if they're both adults and they both consent? After all, love is love. We're dealing with this. I, I did an online debate with four other people about should laws against consensual adult incest be removed? In other words, is it okay for a grown father and grown daughter to have a relationship or two brothers or two sisters? I did an online debate. I was the only one out of the five saying these laws should still stand. Everyone else said they should be removed. This is a discussion in America. Here's another question. Where did we get the idea that marriage was about two people? I've asked gay activists, I've asked them in public debates, I've asked them on my radio program, I've asked them in written articles, I've asked them on social media, why two people in marriage? And they have not yet given me one answer. If it's not a man and a woman, why limit it to two? If marriage is not the union of a man and a woman, then why should it be limited to two people, or for that matter, require two people? Why can't it be one or three or five? What makes the number two so special if it doesn't refer to the union of a male and a female? A man and a woman are physically and biologically designed for each other. Notice, I didn't bring a Bible up here with me. Notice, I'm not quoting scripture. Oh, I could give you biblical arguments for all this, but what we just see by natural law is that a man and a woman are biologically designed for one another in a unique way. We, they carry within themselves the unique components of sperm and egg. The fact remains that there's no such thing as a baby without a male and female involved. And so the two must come together as one to form a marriage. That's why you need two. The man and woman also share a unique complementarity emotionally and spiritually. We have some books that are famous in America. I don't know if they've been translated here. Men are from Mars and women from Venus, you know, from different planets. We're, we're very different in the way we think and act, which is why the union of a man and a woman is special, distinctive, and even sacred. And that's why the union of a man and a woman has been recognized as marriage throughout the ages. There have been homosexual men and women through the ages. There have been people who have been same-sex attracted through the ages. Why didn't we try to redefine marriage a century ago or 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago? Because it was understood that marriage has unique meaning and purpose. Other people can have their relationships. I'm not here to incite hatred against any group. I'm not here to tell people what they do in their private lives. The question is, what is the meaning and purpose of marriage? A cultural anal analyst, Robert Knight, said in the States, the term marriage refers to specifically to the joining of two people of the opposite sex. When that is lost, marriage becomes meaningless. You can no more leave an entire sex out of marriage and call it marriage than you can leave chocolate out of a chocolate brownie recipe. It becomes something else. You say, but we're only discussing civil unions. Trust me, this is step number one. We've seen that also. Once you have civil unions, then the gay activists will say, well, why are you so bigoted? Why can't we have the same marriage rights that you have? It is not enough until it is, quote, marriage equality for all, which then opens the door to all kinds of new definitions and discussions. So why not throuples? Three, a couple of three. This is a real picture from America. This has happened already. This is not a prediction. This has happened more than once. Three women who are all, quote, married. They wore, they wore dresses, gowns, and two of the fathers walk them down the aisles. Why not? If love is love, marriage equality for all. You want this in the Faroe Islands? We have it in America. Thailand, three gay men. They posted their pictures on Facebook, and it went crazy on the Internet. Why not? If love is love. 
Love wins. I have the right to marry the one I love. Marriage equality for all. Why not? Why not polyamory? You say, what's that? Multiple loving relationships in the same household. Maybe two men and two women. Maybe one man and two women. Maybe three women and one man. Whatever the combination is, in America, it's estimated that we have more than 500,000 families living like this. And now the polyamorous are coming to the courts and saying, what about us? They're marching in the gay pride parade saying, we're next. What about us? What about our rights? And remember, the media in America that for many years has been pushing homosexuality, pushing it through TV, through movies, and now in social media and so many other ways, what are they now pushing? This is a TV show in America called Married and Dating about polyamory. Why not polygamy? Polygamy is practiced around the world. Why not that? What if you, what's going to happen in Europe with the increasing Muslim population when they say, what about us? What about our right to have multiple wives? Do you know that this is a show in TV, a major TV show in America, Big Love, a man and his three wives? How about Sister Wives, another TV show in America, a man and his four wives? How about the newest one, My Five Wives? These are all TV shows in America. Before long, they'll be here. This, this is where we are going. Never take offense down until you know the reason it was put up. You start playing with something as fundamental as the meaning of marriage. I'm just telling you what's already happened in America. And in the last few years, public opinion about polygamy in America has gone from 7% approval to 14% approval. It's double. Why? The medium bombardment. And hey, love is love. Justice Kennedy gave the ruling in the Supreme Court decision, June 26, that said that, quote, marriage was the union of two people, two men or two women, as well as a man and a woman. So we had a, a vote five to four. Really, the Supreme Court had no right deciding this. It, it's not up to them to decide the meaning of marriage, but this is what happened. So he gave four major reasons why marriage should be redefined. His first argument was the nature of marriage is that through its enduring bond, two persons together can find other freedoms such as expression, intimacy, and spirituality. Well, why two? There's nothing in that definition that can't be changed to three or four. Why not? The nature of marriage is that through its enduring bond, two persons can, can, can look at it again, two persons together can find other freedoms such as expression, intimacy, and spirituality. So why can't this apply to three or more people? Why is this two? His second argument, the right to marry is fundamental because it supports a two-person union like any other in its importance to the committed individuals. As this court held in Lawrence, this is a famous ruling that said that there was a constitutional right to homosexual sexual acts. Same-sex couples have the same right as opposite-sex couples to enjoy intimate association. Why limit it to two again? If same-sex couples have the right, then why not same-sex throuples or something else? He said a third basis for protecting the right to marry is that it safeguards children and families and thus draws meaning from related rights of child-rearing, procreation, education. Well, a gay couple in themselves can't procreate, so that kind of argues against this, but otherwise, once again, how does this limit marriage to two people? It doesn't. How can someone else say no to, to polygamists or polyamorous if they said yes to gay couples. His fourth argument, marriage is a keystone of our social order. Enabling same-sex couples to marry strengthens rather than weakens marriage in general. Well, then you should let everybody, every relation who wants to marry, marry if, if you want to strengthen relationships. Why not? Why not? So his four arguments really said nothing whatsoever except, hey, if people love each other, we should recognize it as marriage. You can't limit it then in relationship or any other setting. So here's a bigger question. Why does the government even care about marriage? Does the government tell you when you're in school who you can date? Because does the government tell you who you can be friends with? Why do we even care about marriage? Why does the government get involved? And it's very simple. The government's not supposed to be involved in your private life, unless you're breaking the law. 
There's only one reason the government is involved in marriage, and that's because marriage conveys benefits on society, and so the society conveys benefits on marriage. That's the only reason. Marriage produces children for the next generation and joins those children to their mother and father. By definition, that can only happen with a male and female couple. That's why even an older couple being married, they still have the components of male and female. Even a barren couple getting married, they still have those components. You change those components, it now undoes the meaning of marriage. And laws are made based on the norm, on the rule, not on the exception to the rule. So... A homosexual couple, they may love each other dearly. Two men, two women may truly love each other, may truly care for each other, but they cannot reproduce children of their own. And if they bring children into the world, they may really care for those children. They, they may really love those kids. I'm sure that they do. But they cannot provide a mother and father for that child. By definition, they guarantee that the child will either have no mother or no father. And you see, the best social setting for future generations, the best social setting for the well-being of society is solid families. That has been proven over and over and over for generations. A homosexual couple cannot procreate and cannot join the children they raise to their mother and father. Historically, this is all the government cared about. If two men want to live together in a home or two women or a guy and his girlfriend or three people, that's their business as long as they're not breaking the law. That's their business. But to be asked to redefine marriage based on the romantic attractions and sexual desires of less than 2% of the population makes no sense whatsoever. When you redefine marriage, what happens is you render it meaningless. So in human history... There is no society in which marriage simply meant the union of two people, even in societies in which homosexuality was celebrated. Go study it through the centuries, you'll see. Even in cases of polygamous marriages, marriage always required a man and a woman. So this is not happening in England. Again, I'm just telling you what we've learned and seen. As I noted in 2013, as England moves towards redefining marriage, and they've now done that last year, the Daily Telegraph reported that, listen to this, the word husband will in future be applied to women, and the word wife will refer to men. Civil servants have overruled the Oxford English Dictionary and hundreds of years of common usage effectively abolishing the traditional meaning of the words for spouses. Because if two gay men marry and you have a husband and a wife, then one of the men must be the wife. And if two gay women marry, then one of the women must be the husband. And you can now have this in legal contracts. So you can have female husbands and male wives in England. Why? Because when you redefine marriage, you make it meaningless. And this is supposed to help the Faroe Islands move forward. This is something positive. According to a bill passed in California, May of 2014, women could be designated as the father on birth certificates while men could be designated as mother. What was the reason for such an insane piece of legislation? It was done to modernize the definition of the family to reflect same-sex unions. This is being progressive. This is helping make the world a better place. So you have two lesbians, they, they bring a baby into the world through some outside help from a man. Now on the birth certificate, they're both listed. Well, one of them can be listed as the father. So you can have, think of it in England, female husbands, male wives. In California, male mothers and female fathers on birth certificates. And this is supposed to be positive. I began to wonder about this with marriage being so short and you get married, you don't like the person, you divorce them the next day. This is rampant in our heterosexual circles. So I began to think of what new marriage vows might sound like. So here's the man speaking. I take you as my wife, but probably not for life. I take you as my own, but not just you alone. I pledge myself to you and perhaps to others too. I take you as my bride, although your name is Clive. 
It sounds outlandish, but why not? Uh, here, let me just tell you some things that have already happened. Why not you, if, human being plus other? You say, that's degrading, that's insulting. Listen, I'm not comparing the relationship of two men and two women to the relationship between a person and an animal. I'm not making that comparison. Please understand that. What I am saying is once you change the meaning of marriage and say it's not the unique union of a man and woman and what they bring together, it's not that, it's just the union of two people, then you have to ask, where did you get that new definition? And if you just made it up, then why not a person plus something else or someone else? So these are actual things that have already happened. In, in, well, the one before it, there was a woman who married a snake in India. This woman married her dog in England. Here's the woman in India who married the snake. They had a ceremony, and people came for her wedding to the snake. Here's a woman in Israel who married a dolphin. Here's Erica Eiffel. That's her last name. She married the Eiffel Tower. I'm, I'm not kidding you. you. You can read about her online. Erica Eiffel, who married the Eiffel Tower. And then this man in Florida wanted the right to marry his computer. Because he said all of his pornography is on his computer. He has a sexual relationship with his computer. Why can't he marry his computer? You say, that's crazy. Yes, it's crazy. And I'm not comparing this to two men or two women who love each other. What I'm saying is, once you change the meaning of marriage, it can mean anything. Why can't you marry the Eiffel Tower? Well, because it's not marriage. Why can't a man marry a man? Because it's not marriage. And once you change the definitions, everything changes. There are even questions about gay marriage. Gay activists in America are saying maybe it will transform heterosexual marriage. This was a Frenchman who visited America in the early 19th century. And he said, America is certainly the country where the bonds of marriage are most respected and where the concept of conjugal bliss has its highest and truest expression. And he says, in Europe, almost all social disorder stems from disturbances at home and not far removed from the marriage bed. So when you mess things up in marriage, the whole society is messed up. One of the leading gay activists in America says we shouldn't be monogamous, but just kind of like that. He said monogamy is ridiculous and people aren't any good at it and they're not wired for it. Uh, we didn't evolve to be. It's not natural and it places a tremendous strain on our marriages and our long-term commitment to expect them to be effortlessly monogamous. In other words, he's saying that heterosexual couples need to learn from gay couples because they're much more open to sleeping with other people, having sex with other people outside of marriage, and that means marriage will be healthier. So there are gay activists who are saying that gay marriage will now help heterosexual marriage because heterosexual couples will be more free to have sex with other people and they won't be bound by monogamy. This is, this is what we're dealing with. He's one of the leading gay activists in America. Gay activist Jack Nichols said this many years ago. Non-procreative same-sex relationships have a particularly redeeming quality, namely that they take place between people who are the same and can therefore, theoretically at least, welcome others into affectional relationships that bypass exclusivity. This, conceivably, could promote a maximization of affection through communal contact, replacing today's failing models of exclusive, neurotic, narrow, monogamous duos. In other words, same-sex relations open up all these possibilities and hopefully will undo heterosexual marriage. In the early days, gay activists militantly opposed heterosexual marriage. They thought all marriage was antiquated and primitive. But as they were not making headway with their arguments, they began to go on a more conservative route and said, we want marriage like everyone else, but ultimately, Many gay activists do not want marriage like everyone else. They want to change the very meaning and expression of marriage and get it away from this lifelong, just two people commitment, which they say is ridiculous and impossible. 
And then the question is, what about the children? Which is really the biggest issue? Is marriage about the rights of the parents or is marriage ultimately about the best interest of the children? And here, you don't want to have an experiment. You don't want to try it out for a generation and see what happens. Separating children from their mother or father by choice cannot be in the best interest of the child. To make a choice from birth that this child will either have no mother or no father cannot be in the best interest of the child. Children from fatherless homes are seven times more likely to live in poverty. These are stats for America. Six times more likely to commit suicide, more than twice as likely to commit crime, more than twice as likely to become pregnant out of wedlock, worse off academically and socially, worse off physically and emotionally when they reach adulthood. Children from fatherless homes make up 60% of America's rapists, 63% of America's youth suicides, 70% of America's long-term prison inmates, 70% of America's reform school attendees, 71% of America's teenage pregnancies, 71% of America's high school dropouts, 72% of America's adolescent murderers, 85% of America's youth prisoners, 85% of America's youth with behavioral disorders, 90% of America's runaways. Now, these are fatherless homes, and I understand stats will be different if you have two men or two women, but it's simply saying when you just have a mother raising children without the influence of the father, it can be disastrous. And here's a little secret. The world's best mother does not equal a father. Having a household with two mothers still deprives the child of a father, which is a terrible loss. We don't have enough stats now on homes without mothers, but soon we will because we'll have more and more children raised by two men. So this, here's a little girl growing up, just think of it. She's growing up, she needs certain affirmation, she needs certain bonding with a female figure. She doesn't have it because she has two men raising her. She begins to go through her changes as a teenager there. There's no female figure working in her life, and on and on. And she grows up and never sees how a mother and father interact never sees how men and women interact and the role of each in society. This is not in the best interest of children. And what about children from anonymous sperm donors? In many cases, that is how children will be born, say, to a lesbian couple, an anonymous sperm donor. A major report was released in 2010, My Daddy's Name is Donor, a new study of young adults conceived through sperm donation. On average, this was a result of the survey, young adults conceived through sperm donation are hurting more, are more confused, and feel more isolated from their families. They fare worse than their peers raised by biological parents on important outcomes such as depression, delinquency, and substance abuse, nearly two-thirds agree my sperm donor is half of who I am. Now, what's interesting is you'll always hear these studies have been done, been done comparing gay parents with, with opposite-sex parents, and the kids raised by gay parents are doing just as well in every way. Well, first, the studies are very, very limited. And major studies have come out with very, very different results. And the moment they do, the people get attacked. The moment we raise something scientific that differs with the goals of gay activism, we get blasted and attacked in the ugliest possible terms. But you know what is commonly seen? The children raised in same-sex households experiment more sexually, have more gender identity confusion, and have a higher percentage of themselves identifying as homosexual when they grow up. There are impacts. The way we're raised does make an impact. More than half say that when they see someone who resembles them, they wonder if they are related. Almost as many say they have feared being attracted to or having sexual relations with someone to whom they are unknowingly related because they don't know who their father is. And they see someone that looks like them and wonder, maybe that's my sister. Maybe that's my brother. Here's, Here's a poem from a young person who doesn't know who the father is called Uncertainty is Killing Me. And remember, you guarantee this happening over and over and over again when you bring people into a same-sex household. Think about the children. Think about the next generation. Who are you? This is written to her father, but she doesn't know who her father is. 
Who are you? Will I pass you in the street? Will you hold the door for me and smile as I walk into a gas station during my travels? Will you look at me and wonder if I belong to you? You have the pleasure of knowing I could be here. For 19 years, I was denied of knowing you even existed. What was my grandmother, your mother like? What about my grandfather, your father? Why do you get to selfishly keep them all to yourself? Who are you to deny me half of my family tree? Branches rich and strong with stories I may never be told. Who are you to give away my heritage knowing it will be replaced with something false? Do I have brothers and sisters with my dark hair and my deep brown eyes? Will I be attracted to a familiar stranger in my classes? Will I fall in love with him and kiss him passionately in an act of accidental incest? Have you told your wife? Have you told your partner? What about your children? Have you told your brothers and sisters about their mysterious niece? Are you dead? Will you ever read this? Have you dismissed it as something in your past that you did to make ends meet? Did they pay you to give me away? What did you spend the money on? Did you buy a sparkling necklace for your ex-girlfriend? Did you buy books? The bank you went to would have paid you half of my college algebra book for the donation that included me. Did you buy a candy bar at a gas station? Was I worth it? Do you miss me? Do you ever think of me? Do I even cross your mind? Does the uncertainty drive you crazy? Was it worth it? Do you wonder when my birthday is? What color gown I wore to my graduation? Would you be proud to know I was the valedictorian of my senior class? Would you support that I am Christian? Would you even want me in your life? I want you in mine. I will accept anything about you if I could just get the privilege of knowing who you are, of knowing who my family is. We're hearing from more and more children raised in same-sex households who say, I love my two moms. I love my two dads. They were great for me, but it's terrible. It's terrible I was raised without a mother or without a father. And now that I have my own family, I see what I missed growing up. And then just a couple of more things. We have seen now a real threat to religious liberties in America. If you value freedom, if you value freedom of speech, hear this warning from America. The four judges who voted against redefining marriages gave strong warnings. Chief Justice Roberts said, today's decision, for example, creates serious questions about religious liberty. Many good and decent people oppose same-sex marriage as a tenet of faith, and their freedom to exercise religion is, unlike the right imagined by the majority, actually spelled out in the Constitution Amendment 1. Our first constitutional amendment guarantees freedom of religion, guarantees it. It is a bedrock of our society. And yet when the court said redefine marriage, the chief justice said this will attack that fundamental freedom. It's happening all over Europe and in other nations already. Justice Scalia weighed in with a strong warning. Justice Thomas, another strong warning. Justice Alito, he said it will be used to vilify Americans who are unwilling to assent to the new orthodoxy. Because I say, you know, it, it's best not to tamper with something like marriage. You know, it's best for a kid to have a mom and dad. I get called every ugly name imaginable. I have people tell me I'm worse than Adolf Hitler because I say a kid should have a mom and a dad. The attack against you is nonstop. Why? Because you are going against the goals of gay activism. As friendly as it may sound on the outside, when you stand against it, you will come under nonstop attack. Immediately after the Supreme Court ruling, this is some of the stuff that people began to post on social media, on my Twitter account. Dr. Michael L. Brown moved to the moon, religious terrorist and hater. Because I say, you know, you really shouldn't redefine marriage and biologically and every other way a man's made for a woman and a woman for a man. And then on a biblical basis, I believe in the right definition of marriage is the lifelong union of a man and a woman. You know, kids should have a mom and dad. Because of that, I'm a religious terrorist and a hater. Another one, Christian hater, rifflaff, like Dr. Michael L. Brown and others, must be brought to justice. Zero tolerance for the scum. They want us put in jail. You say, crazy. Okay, this is where we're going. On my Facebook page, God's design for Christian haters is to end up in prison. You can be a pastor of a church and get up and preach with tears 
with love for the homosexual community and say, but I cannot agree to redefine marriage and you will be called a hater and a bigot. It is ugly, it is intolerant, and it is hateful. That's where the hate is coming from, sad to say. Dr. Angela McCaskill, she's a deaf woman, black American woman, the first black American woman to graduate from her university with a PhD as a university for the deaf. She was involved with the school for over 20 years, was greatly loved there. She signed a petition in her home state saying, can we vote on marriage? We don't want the Congress to decide it. We would like to vote on the meaning of marriage ourselves. For signing that petition, she was put on leave in her school. She was so traumatized, she was under doctor's care. It took months before the school finally brought her back and they paid no penalties and admitted to no wrongdoing in the courts. Just because she signed a petition saying, can we vote on the meaning of marriage? Sarah Crank, 14 years old, testifies before her local Senate that children should have a mother and father as a result of which she got a stream of death threats. 14 years old. Aaron and Melissa Klein, they recently had $135,000 seized from their bank accounts by the US government. Why? They're Christians, they own a bakery. They used to, they've gone out of business now. A lesbian couple came in and said, we'd like you to bake us a cake for our wedding. And they said, we're Christians, we, we don't do that. There are other bakeries here, plenty of other bakeries. They were polite, we don't do that. The women said they were so traumatized, they suffered $135,000 in emotional damages. The court sided with them and when the clients were fighting this in court, the courts seized the money out of their bank account. And they're out of business now. Baron L. Stutzman, a grandmother in her 70s. She had a gay customer for many years, friendly with him. He came in the store and she said, the, the gay customer said, I'd like you to provide the floral arrangements, the flowers for my wedding. That's what she does. She's a florist. She took him by the hand. She said, it's the hardest thing she ever did. She said, I'm sorry, I can't. And they, they continued to talk. Tell me about the wedding, who's going to walk you down the aisle. They had a friendly talk. She was able to refer the person to others. Others found out about it, brought her to court. The court is not only trying to take her business, but all of her personal assets as well. Here's the problem. I have gave you a few examples. Would you like 10 examples? Would you like 20? Would you like 50? Would you like 100? We've even had people go to jail over this, and it's only getting worse. A regular occurrence. Students have been kicked out of their schools over these issues. Coming to a place near you if you open the door to it. I just want to say this, and to members of parliament, if you vote the wrong way, I warned you in advance. Don't anyone say we didn't know what was coming next. And then lastly, the T of LGBT. Please don't tell me that the Faroe Islands is different than America when gay activists already have LGBT. The T is already here. Of course, we're completely different countries. And being here reminds me of a better time in America's history. A time when kids could run on the streets freely and stay out and parents knew that they were safe. You still have that here. We don't have that in America. I'm not blaming that on gay activists. No, absolutely not. For many, many other reasons. You have a greater innocence here still in your culture. And yet, you already have the T on LGBT. Transgender is already part of it. Listen, my heart goes out to those who struggle. I can't imagine. I have an older cousin who at almost 70 years old, said, I'm not a man, I'm a woman in a man's body. And of course, it's had tremendous impact in his marriage and children. My heart breaks for these people. But you don't redefine society based on the struggles of a few. And once you open the door further to gay activism, it keeps going further with other issues. So it's not just something as sad and crazy as Bruce Jenner, the great Olympic athlete, being named Woman of the Year. This was in a major magazine in America. He's, he's still a biological male, okay? 
and yet he gets named woman of the year, my heart goes out to him. But what about the children in schools? Here, this just happened in, in Canada. As a result of newly enacted guidelines in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, based on gender identity and gender expression, Calgary lawyer John Carpe observes that, quote, every Alberta student, male and female alike, now has the right to use the girls' washrooms and change rooms, depending not on the reality of biology, but purely on the student's own feeling. So a boy who identifies as a girl can use the girls' bathroom with the other six-year-old girls, and if the other girls have a problem with it, that's their problem. Schools at which kids wear uniforms can no longer insist that only girls wear skirts. That's being sexist. That's locking people into male-female. Girls must be allowed to join the boys' hockey team. Boys are entitled to attend a girls' sex education class. Schools must work toward the elimination of single-gender sports, meetings, clubs, and activities. Schools must even stop using gendered language like mother, father, him, her, mister, and missus, and instead use non-gendered language like caregivers and partners. Right in my own city, a preschool for four-year-olds, the teachers cannot say boys and girls because that is making a gender distinction. They must call them friends instead. This is in California. That boy, 17 years old, now identifies as a girl. He just says he believes he's a girl. He now plays on the girls' baseball team. And he can use the same locker room with the other girls. You can go today, in America, we have all these gyms to work out. You can go into a gym, you're ladies, you're in the ladies' room, you're changing, and a man walks in there dressed like a woman. If he identifies as a woman, he can go in your locker room. And if you have a problem with it, you can leave. This, this is happening all over America. It is the T of LGBT. Facebook in America now gives people 50 different ways to define their gender. In other words, male and female was not enough. Male, female, transgender was not enough. They came up with 50 different ways. This is Facebook in America. 50 ways to define your gender. You can pick 10 different definitions at once. That was not enough, though. The gay activist said that's not sufficient. 50 options is not sufficient. I'm telling you, this has happened already in America. So they came up with one more option, fill in the blank. Call your gender whatever you want it. And here, to give you an example of how far it goes, this is from a, a, a pro-transgender website talking about multi-gender. And these are some of the definitions, ambigender, bi-gender, blur gender, call gender, conflict gender, cosmic gender, Christian gender, delicious gender, dura gender, demi and on and on. You say, what does it mean? They each has a definition. Gender cluster, gender fluid, gender fuzz, gender spiral, gender swirl, gender vex, gen live or gender, pan gender, poly gender, tri gender. Ask the LGBT activists if they reject this. Ask the LGBT activists if they, uh, if, if they say no to the 50 ways to define your gender on Facebook. Ask them if they think that that's crazy, or ask them is, would they like to see that in Faroe Islands also. In conclusion, there's so much more we could say. On each of these points, I could lecture for hours with massive documentation of every point. In conclusion, same-sex marriage is definitely regress. It's definitely a step in the wrong direction. It is not progress. So again, my hope is these simple words can be considered. Parliamentarians who are voting on this, I hope that you will seriously consider these things. And just remember your accountability to the next generation. That's the real issue. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the courageous Christian leader in Germany, said this, the ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world that it leaves to its children. What kind of world are you leaving to your children and grandchildren when you redefine marriage? What happens to the long-term stability and good of society? 
We were watching this experiment fail in Scandinavia where marriage is less and less meaningful. And in some cases, the great majority of people live together outside of wedlock. I'm talking about heterosexual, meaning in general is degenerating. And then the children raised in those environments have more and more and more problems. We see the failing of this experiment in America in many, many ways. Learn from our terrible mistakes. That's my appeal. And preserve much of the beauty that you have of your culture and preserve the beauty and sanctity of marriage. Thank you so much.